Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for uh, today and the opportunity. I pray that every heart would be inspired, but also, Lord, there's going to be a little bit of conviction. So, Lord, I just ask that we would take it with grace and that we would all be encouraged, that we would have an unwavering faith in the man, Jesus, in the unshakable gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, there is a much bigger purpose, there is a much bigger reason on why you have the job that you have, on the way that you have routines in life. And I know a lot of us can get stuck with routines and get stuck in a rut, but I want you just to step back from the normal, and I want you to look at your life from God's perspective, and I want you to ask this question, why on earth am I here doing what I'm doing? And I venture to say it's because God has a specific assignment within the culture that you're ministering into or the culture that you're working into. And the bigger assignment for our life is to integrate the gospel into every realm of what we are engaged in. If you're a realtor, how could you engage other people? Get the sale of the house, amen? But how are you gonna integrate the life transformational gospel of Jesus to a hurting and dying world? If you are a computer engineer, a software programmer, how can you minister life to the coworkers, maybe in the cubicle next to you or, or your boss that's above you? How can you integrate the gospel? The bigger purpose on why God just has, has allowed us to stay here on earth after receiving Jesus is so we would have high impact for Jesus wherever we go. If you're a stay home at mom, look at the routines of life. Look at dropping your kids off at soccer practice, picking them up from school. Think about the relationships that you have maybe at the gym. How can you learn to weave in the gospel? Today's message is gonna be about the vision of the Rock Church. The vision of the Rock Church it hasn't changed since I've been here, and it's not going to change moving forward. It is to pursue God, to equip you to reach this world. And so today I want to go ahead and talk about this reaching component on how we at The Rock are going to reach people for Jesus. And really, we are going to reach people for Jesus on Sunday, but we want to equip you to reach people Monday through Saturday. Amen? So from the first chapter of Colossians today, we're going to learn three important principles on knowing how to effectively reach people for Jesus. Not according to what we think we should do, but according to what God tells us to do. And how many of you guys know there's a difference? What we think is effective for reaching people might stimulate them a little bit, might, uh, might itch their ears a little bit, but how God tells us to do it in his word, that needs to take preeminence. Colossians chapter 1 Verse three through four gives us the first principle on how to be effective in reaching people. It says in verse three, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Paul puts it this way in Galatians, the only thing that counts in this life is your faith operating itself in love. But I want you to underline, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. If we want to be effective in reaching people at the workplace, in Danville, or wherever you're from, number one, you got to write this down, people need to start hearing about your faith in Jesus Christ. People need to start hearing about your faith in Jesus Christ, they need to start hearing what you stand for. Listen, we live in perilous times. We live in times where there's a lot of confusion about what reality is and what the truth is and what the gospel says. This is not a time that you should be shrinking back in your faith. This is a time that you should be pressing forward in your faith. God wants us to impact the people around us, but in order for us to have reach with the gospel, people gotta start hearing what you stand for. You gotta begin to define yourself Define yourself in the workplace as a person of faith, because if you don't define yourself as a person of faith, then people are going to define you for how they perceive you. For example, you're just a quiet guy. You do your job well, but you're just a quiet person. 
You know what? You're, 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 just, um, you're, you're just go with the steady flow. You're a nice person. You're a faithful person. But how many of you guys know you can be a faithful person, a nice person, but until people actually hear about our faith, they're not going to believe that you're anything else and that there's no power behind your name. And the power that's behind your name is with the person who's living inside of you, Jesus Christ. Amen? So we need to define ourselves as a person of faith. And here's the key thing. A person, how many guys know there's lots of faiths out there? We're going to cover some of them today. So like I said, buckle your safety belt. But you got to define yourself as a person of faith in Jesus Christ. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, who's Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus? We live in a culture where there is so much confusion around the name that should be above every other name. Who is this Jesus guy? A lot of people have a lot of different answers and it was no different in the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians, what you will soon see is that people of that culture were beginning to slap different meanings on the name of Jesus. And it's no different today. How many of you guys know? Unbelievers slap different names upon the name of Jesus, different meanings to his name. Jehovah's Witnesses will slap a different meaning on the name of Jesus. Mormons will slap a different meaning to the name of Jesus. Christian Scientology will slap a different meaning to the name of Jesus. The New Age movement will slap different meanings to the name of Jesus. And unfortunately, many Many, many, many Christians will slap different meanings to this name of Jesus. How do they slap different meanings to the name of Jesus? Simple. They devalue him. They dethrone him. They mystify him. They take his name in vain. Some call him a good teacher. Some call him just a prophet. Others say he's, a, he's my savior, but I can live my life however I want and do whatever I want to do. The majority of people that I notice in our culture are quite the opposite. You know what they do if they're not from a religious sect. The majority of people just make fun of this person named Jesus. I'm reminded of what Jesus told Peter before he was crucified on the cross. He looks at Peter and he says, Peter, who do people say that I am in the culture that I'm ministering to? And I have to ask you that question. Who do people say in the culture that we are to minister to about the name of Jesus? Who do people say that I am would say Jesus to us today? We're about ready to watch a little clip, a video clip. And this clip is full of garbage, absolute garbage in the trash that other people are saying about Jesus, from Hollywood to cartoon images making fun of the name of Jesus to people on the streets making fun of Jesus. But the reality is, this is the culture that we live in. Who is Jesus? What does our culture say about him? Let's check this out. White guy with a beard? <laughs> Oh my God, you are! You're Jesus Christ! He died for our sins so that we could be saved. And in my religion, it means we can f up as much as we want. And as long as we are truly sorry, and then we're saved. A white guy looks like he's from the 60s. A reason to believe and to continue on in your life and your journey. Not that blonde haired dude that they show in all those pictures. I think Jesus was just a story made up by someone. Could have been probably a, a, a real person with something special, but uh, not, not, not like the story says. You know. I'm actually glad you're all here tonight. I want to tell you that one of you will betray me. Nah, <laughs> just kidding. Ah, he's doing that thing he did in his storybook. Uh, Jesus, a friend of mine from Puerto Rico. I don't know. I, I don't know Jesus very well, so... Jesus? Like Jesus? The Son of God? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Definitely not the guy who cuts my lawn. Dear Tiny and for Jesus. Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. Yes, there's definitely something special about Jesus. The same things that are special about me and you and, well, everybody. Definitely good morals and beliefs, and, um, possibly had 
some special gift. Oh, oh my God! Jesus. Oh my God. It's, it's Jesus! It's Jesus! And his best pal, Peter! Oh, 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 wow! Who do you say Jesus is? <sighs> He's really important. His, his birthday's coming up. People, believe in Jesus. He's your savior. He's number one. Everyone is giddy with anticipation for Jesus to come out because as we all know, if Jesus comes out of his house and is not scared by his shadow, it means the next thousand years will be full of peace and love. He was just really chill. I think he even smoked some pot, so I love Jesus even more. He seems like a kind of Gandhi type guy. Some superpower, I just don't know. I, I believe in him, him, so. <laughs> Uh, he was Jewish. Look, I think he's inspiring for a lot of people, so that's really cool to me. God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> a make-believe story that Scott blown out of proportion. If that video doesn't bother you and you're a Christian, then we got to evaluate something deep within. That video is full of trash and garbage. You see, our culture does not deny Jesus. They just dethrone Jesus. And before you can deny Jesus as a culture, there has to be a dethroning process. And if we're going to impact the culture around us, it's time to put Jesus back to his rightful place on the throne. He's not just a cartoon little figurine that people can make fun of. He's the son of God. His name has power. And he is the one in whom every knee will bow. Jesus asked Peter, who do people say that I am? And if he was here today, he would say that to us. Who do people say that I am? And you just witnessed who people say that he is. But Jesus then turns to Peter and he says, that's what culture says, but what do you say? And that's really what matters, does it not? Is who do you say Jesus is? You gotta know for yourself, and we can't rely on culture to sprinkle their ideas of who Jesus is, because how many of you guys know, our culture has a lot of weird ideas of who Jesus is. And in the book of Colossians, we learned that there was a ton of spiritual weirdness from the outside that was starting to be sprinkled on the inside of the church, which over time began to mess with the name of Jesus. Who is Jesus in the book of Colossians? As you look on the screen, as we look into Colossian heresy, we got to know a little bit of the background of the book, okay? We're not told in the book exactly what the heresy is. Uh, heresy means false teachings of Jesus. But we know from bits and pieces through the scripture and through the cultural background of what was being practiced about what the obstacles were in which the Colossian church was addressing. Now, a lot of people from that culture were looking for an experience with God. They wanted to experience the fullness of God. And so these are the things that had invaded the church in order for the church to get more of an experience of God. They valued educationalism. That's fine. But what they did is they put Greek philosophy over their faith. Number two, at the same time they valued education, they were entangled and fascinated with this weird thing called mysticism. There was, a, there was an enlightenment uh, agenda for encountering spiritual angels. I'll get into that in a second. Then there was legalism. There were some Christian Jews saying, you know what, in order to experience the fullness of God, not only do you have to believe in him, but you gotta really start doing all these rules in order to really be accepted by him. You gotta watch what you eat. You gotta celebrate religious holidays. Then there was ritualism. Ritualism. People began messing around with horoscopes and astrology. Listen, if you want direction from the, for, for your life, it's time to open this and not the newspaper and look for the horoscope of how to direct your life. Then there was the beginning roots of Gnosticism. What is this thing of Gnosticism? The Greek word for Gnosticism comes from the root gnosis, which means a secret knowledge, a knowledge that was secret that you had to be tapped on, tapped into. So what was happening at that, in that culture is people were saying, if you want to experience the fullness of God, the thing that matters the most is a higher spirit. And everything of the physical matter was all evil. The chair that you're sitting in, it's evil. Your skin, your flesh, it's evil because it's physical matter. And Jesus must not have the fullness of God because he was born a man. He had flesh. And in between matter 
over here in the spirit up here, there are hierarchies of angels that you can supposedly communicate with. And for every higher level that you increase in, there was more of a potential to receive the fullness of God. God divvied up his presence among all these hierarchies of angels. The higher encounters that you get with God, the more fullness of God that you obtain. And because this Gnosticism was beginning to spread in the Colossae church, you had two groups that formed out of it. The first group said, well, if all your flesh is evil and everything of this body is evil, then guess what? I can do whatever I want. They gave into immoralism, sensualism, elusiveness. They can do whatever they want. Live for pleasure now. Why not? Tomorrow we die. Go for it. The only thing that matters is the spiritual world. So it doesn't really matter what I do with my body. Then you had the other extreme, which gave into asceticism. What's asceticism? It means people began to beat their bodies and deny themselves all types of pleasure. Even the gum that you're chewing would be considered pleasure. So you can't experience any pleasures in life. And so you have these extremes all happening in the church of Colossae. And then finally, you have this thing called syncretism. Syncretism. What is syncretism? Syncretism is all around us today. It's the mixing of good from all the religions it's the practice of everything. It's, the, it's valuing diversity in the practice of everything and putting it in a big pot of soup. But because Jesus was new in that culture, you know what they did? They just added Jesus into the soup as well. And so this is the culture of Colossae. They devalued Jesus. They began to dethrone him over time. And so over time, the church began to question now, who is Jesus? Perhaps he was just an angel. Perhaps Jesus is just a man of matter, which is bad, but maybe he had spiritual encounters with angels and acquired a secret knowledge that he tapped into. Perhaps Jesus was just a good teacher, but what really matters is your encounter in the spiritual world with angels. Perhaps Jesus was good. That's good, but you still got to follow strict rules if you want to be accepted by God. Perhaps Jesus is the son of God, but you can't say he's equal with God. You see what the culture was doing was being sprinkled in the church. And so over time, they weren't, devalue, they weren't valuing Jesus in his rightful place. They didn't deny him. They just began to dethrone him, just like our culture is doing today. And if we want to effectively reach people with Jesus and who Jesus is, then guess what? It's high time that we put Jesus back on the throne where he belongs. Jesus is the creator of all things. He is the eternally existing one. For by him and through him, everything was created for him. He's the sustainer over all things, and he's above everything. At his name, all the people in heaven and on earth will bow their, name, uh, bow their knee and claim him to be Lord. He is holy. He is righteous. He is the one who created man, and he's the one who will give an account to you for the works that you've done on this earth. Demons tremble before him. Souls are saved because of him. At his name, above every other name, all people will bow their knees. He deserves preeminence. So Paul wastes no time putting Jesus back on the throne, just like what we need to do today as a church. The reason why culture is the way it is is because the church has been on the back, on the back seat of the car and not driving the car for where this nation should be going. Oh, there's truth there. Verse 15, notice what Paul does, putting him on the throne. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, everybody say all things, were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the end, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased, here we go, to have all his fullness dwell in God. The fullness of God is in the person of Jesus. Jesus is to God as the light is to the sun. You can't separate God from Jesus because they are one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in order to reach people, not only do we need to put Jesus back on the throne of our lives, but number two, we need to know what he did, and that leads to we need to know how to share 
the true message of the gospel. The true message of the gospel. Look at with me in verse 5. It says this. The faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard, here we go, the true message of the gospel. Is that what your Bible says, the true message? The true message of the gospel that has come to you. In order to understand the true gospel, guess what? You got to know that there's a lot of fake gospels out there. How many guys know there's a lot of fake gospels out there? Gospel means good news, but what does the good news actually entail? There's a fake gospel out there, we'll call it the counterfeit gospel, which simply says this, and I know you've heard it. If you try harder in your life, maybe you'll be good enough and make it to heaven. Have we heard that before? Do good, do good, do good, and maybe you'll be accepted by God. That's a false gospel. In fact, that's cult land. Everybody say cult land. All cults teach that you have to earn your way to heaven. Number two, how about this one? God understands you. You just got to be nice and you'll be saved. This last week, I went out witnessing. This is kind of a new one uh, that I've experienced here in Danville. Uh, last week, I took a staffer out. In about an hour, we talked with 24 people about the gospel. Out of those 24 people that we talked to, 14 of them said this, that I should go to heaven because I'm a nice person. That's the good news. I'm going to say, that's, that, that's not, God, does God want you to be nice? Yes. But you can't get to heaven being nice. We'll get to that in a second. And then a lot of people confuse the good Christian messages, because there's a lot of good Christian messages, with the gospel. For example, how many of us have heard this? Come to God because he wants to bless you. Is that true? Yes. Does God want to bless you? Of course he wants to bless you. But that's not the gospel. How about this one? God loves you and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. Is that true? But is that the gospel? That's not the gospel. How about this one? Come to God because he wants to fill a deep void in your heart and he sees pain. Is that true? Of course that's true, but that is not the gospel. Listen, if sin, uh-oh, if sin never gets addressed and there's no mention of the cross and what Jesus did for you by shedding his blood, then there is no gospel. The gospel is the fundamental blocks in which the church builds from. In order to get the blessings of God, you gotta have right relationship with God, and it starts with knowing the gospel. So what is the true gospel? Paul summarizes it in verse 19. Go ahead and look with me. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, Verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel. Everybody say it. This is the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and have been proclaimed to every creature under heaven in which Paul is a servant. So what is the true gospel according to this text? There's three points if you want to know what the gospel is. Number one, the true gospel always addresses the epidemic problem that we all have, which is sin, which results in our separation from God. It starts back with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, when God created him, them, they had perfect unity with God and with each other. There was no pain. There was no sorrow. There was complete harmony. But God laid down one specific rule, as it were, because he didn't want robots. He gave us a choice. He said, I don't want you to eat from the tree. Guess what they did? The moment they disobeyed God, sin entered the relationship, and now sin separated them from God. And the Bible says all of us have sin. All of us have sin. All have sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So I go to the streets and I ask people, have you ever lied? Yes, but you're a nice person. Uh, have you ever cheated? Yes, but you're a nice person. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Yes, but I'm a nice person. Have you ever hated anyone for no cause? Yes, but I'm still a nice person. Have you ever done anything bad? Have you ever gotten into a fight? Have you ever lusted, greed, anything, anger, lashed out at somebody? Yes. Oh yeah, but you're a nice person. 
You see, sin separates us from God. So the first element in, in proclaiming the true gospel is we got to address the sin. If there was no sin, then why would Jesus have to come down to earth and die on a cross? If we could earn our way to heaven, then there would be no purpose for Jesus coming out of heaven onto earth to bring us back into heaven when we breathe our last breath. We got to understand that Jesus came to suffer the penalty of our sin, which leads to the second point of the true gospel. The true gospel always declares the good news and what Jesus did to reconcile you back to himself. Listen, Jesus came out of heaven onto earth. He was born of a virgin. He preached, he taught, and he healed many people. At the end of his life, he was crucified on the cross, not for what, I, for what you did, I'm sorry, not for what he did, but for what he, but, I'm sorry, but for what we did, not for what he did. Jesus was crucified for what we did, not what he did. The Bible puts it this way. We declare unto you, and we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, you don't allow people to sit in their funk after they say, hey, yeah, I got sin issues. Listen, we all have sin issues. But the, problem, the issue is, what are we going to do with those, that sin issue? This is the purpose of why Jesus came and died on the cross and rose from the dead. It's so when we believe in him, all your sin, everybody say, all my sin. All your sin gets eradicated from God's heart, mind, and books in heaven. All of it gets washed away. And he declares you to be the righteousness of God. You went from filth to purity. You went from tarnished to gold. You went from blemished to without spot or wrinkle in his sight. You've been covered with the blood. You've been cleansed. You're holy and blameless before him. It doesn't matter what guilt says to you. It doesn't matter what Satan lies to you at night and tries to put you into a, a, a place of condemnation about your past, you've been cleansed if you believe in the shed blood of Jesus. Give him praise. <laughs> Number three, the true gospel always capitalizes on God's grace. It always capitalizes on God's grace. Look at Colossians 1.6. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it. And look at this. And truly understood God's grace. What is grace? Grace means completely unearned. That you can't labor yourself into right relationship with God. Again, if you could earn it, then there would be no point for Jesus to be coming down to earth in the first place. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2.8, For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works so that no man can boast. God gives you eternal life as a gift. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to labor for it. It doesn't matter how many times you serve at a church. It, I had one guy this last week, why should God let you into heaven? Because I went to a Christian school for 10 years. <laughs> you need to go back to Christian school and go to the basics 101. I remember when I was uh, working in corporate and there was a, a Mormon missionary. He was quitting to go start a mission. And I would talk to him about what is the gospel, you know, according to him. And what is grace according to him. And he said, I describe grace, saving grace, like this. Let's pretend you're a kid. Let's all pretend we're a kid. And we really want a bike. And so we are going to, it costs 20 bucks, and we're going to work hard for that bike. And we're going to labor for that bike. And so we're going to do a bunch of good things to please the Father so we can purchase that bike. Well, at the end of your life, you get to $19. The boy gets to $19. And now you stand before the father and you go, Dad, I tried. I mean, I tried everything I could do. I did this and this and this and this, but I still fell short. Will you? Just, I, I don't know what to do. I fell short. And he said, grace is God giving you the extra dollar. And I said, wow, that's heresy. That's horrible. That's not grace at all. That's something that you're laboring for. And Jesus goes, okay, well, you tried hard, so I'm going to let you in. I'll, I'll spare you. No, 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 no. Grace is Jesus purchased the bike 
for you, paid in his blood. You don't have to do anything for it. It can't be taken from you. God is the one who provided the bike for you, the bike of your salvation, and you can just ride into heaven based upon the works that Jesus did for you, not based upon what you're trying to labor for yourself. My final point in today's message is we need to know how to proclaim this gospel. We need to know how to proclaim this gospel. And let me tell you, here at the Rock Church, we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel. We're not going to back away from the gospel. Without the gospel, there is no church. Without the gospel, there is no hope. Notice what Paul says in verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven in which I, Paul, have become a servant. This last week, I've been praying this. God, make me a servant of the gospel. I don't think I've ever prayed that in my life. I know that we're to declare the gospel, that it's the hope of the world. But this week I started praying, God, I want to be a servant of the gospel. How many of you guys feel called to be a servant of the gospel? It's so funny. This last week, before we went out witnessing, I videotaped myself and a staffer. And I said, this is Billy. This is a staffer. I don't feel like going out right now. I don't think anyone's going to get saved. I don't think anybody wants to hear the gospel. I really feel like no one's going to listen to me. They're all going to reject us. We went out this last week to downtown Danville. In one hour, we spoke to 24 people. Out of those 24 people, 18 of them said yes to Jesus, turned from their sin, and accepted Christ. Don't tell me people don't want the gospel. Don't tell me people don't want the gospel. People need to hear good news. Nobody wants to walk around with the sin and the weight on their shoulders. Everybody wants to be in right relationship with God. Everybody wants to know what it means to have the peace of God, to have the forgiveness of sins, to have eternal life, to become a child of God and have his presence living in them. You can't have that without the gospel. Here at this church, we want to equip you guys on how to share the gospel, how to win people to Jesus, how to infect this town with the saturation of the gospel of Christ. It comes with us being the people that God has called us to be. Will you take that challenge? Will you take that challenge? Will you take it to your homes? Take it to your workplace? This is what God has called us to do. We want to transform the city. We don't want to just claim Danville for Jesus. How many people want to win Danville for Jesus? Amen? Amen? Let's give the Lord a round of applause.